Welcome to church, everyone. So good to have you with us. This is a special day. It's Mother's Day. And mums to you out there, a special thanks. And we, we trust that by now you would have been treated as a special person this morning. And we want you to know that you are special to us. But we are wanting to extend that to all our women. We celebrate all women on this day. You are special to us. You've done amazing things for us and for this world. And of course, it's true. None of us would have been here if it weren't for our mums. So welcome this morning. And welcome to you if you're also joining for the first time. It's so good to have you with us. And we trust that you would fit, it, fit into this and, and feel at home and want to come back next week. And we'd love to journey with you as you explore what it looks like to follow Jesus. We're going to sing right now. Join us in song as we do that.
you say mama? Mama. She teach me to say the lines. And you call her name? School at the morning. Teach me to sing a song. Good up. Of eagles. Walking on her tippy toes. Tucker. She's good at making aeroplanes. Getting no my nappy cartwheels. And what's what's mummy good at? Nachos. Ah, uh, spaghetti bolognese. Good laugh, cuddles. Of course, she has a heart. She gives me cuddles at night. What do you love about mummy? Does she do something nice for you? Does she play games with you? Does she make you something to eat? Does she take you places? Does she do anything? Do you love mum? That was so good to hear from some of our kids about their mothers and what they appreciate about their mums. About my mum, I'd like to tell you something about my mum. If you had asked me what's her favourite food growing up, I might have said, well, perhaps it would have been condensed milk or uh, when you make caramel. She loved caramel. But really, her favourite food was when we went out once a year on holiday, we went out to this French restaurant. We had to dress up and have ties on, and we all went out to this fancy restaurant. So, Mum, I recognise that as your favourite food. For my own wife, if I had to ask her, what's your favourite food? She would say to me, Ray, it's whenever you cook, because I don't like to cook, or she doesn't like to cook, and she loves it when I cook. So that's her favourite food, and she's such a great wife, and I want to honour her today as well. Right now, we want to do something a bit different. We want to honour all of our women. So I'm going to ask everyone in the home where you are to stand, except the mums and women, and we're going to do what people have done around the world. We're going to give you a, a, an applause uh, to celebrate you and to celebrate your life and what you mean to us. So everybody, right where you are, and I'm talking to each of you, stand up with me and let's give a round of applause to all the women in our life. Come on, join me. Let's do it. Moms, we celebrate you and we thank you and we honor you. God bless you. I'm going to pray for you right now, and I also want to pray for Christians around the world. So let's join as we pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come right now and pray for our mums and for women in general. Lord, we want to pray that you might honor them in a special way. And Lord, they show your love to us in ways that we perhaps wouldn't understand if it weren't for them. So we thank you for them, Lord, and we pray you might encourage them. And Lord, in times like these, when we're shut in our homes, sometimes it's a bit hard to feel special, but we do trust, Lord, that they would feel special right now. And so we honor them. We pray you might encourage each of our women. Lord, encourage them as they follow you and encourage them in the giftedness you've given them. At the same time, Lord, we pray for Christians around the world as we join together as a global village. It seems like we're crowd-sharing ideas. We're joining together, Lord, as one community across the world, one church outside of buildings. We're joining together. And, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are doing it tough, who perhaps don't have it as easy as we do in Australia. We pray for them, encourage them as they meet today on Sunday or whatever day they meet. Lord, might they know your presence and your power and your strength. And Lord, right now we commit our offering to you and we pray, Lord, that as people give and give in these strange times that you might honor them, provide for them and allow us as a church, Lord, to continue to do the work that we're doing. So we give you all honor and praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you also for those that have been giving regularly to our church. 
We recognize that for some of you it's harder at this time. And for those that have been giving and have been giving beyond what you normally give, we want to thank you. So go ahead and use our app or, or give online um, as we support God's work together in this community and beyond. God bless you as you do that. Thank you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. This is the fourth week in our Ask It series. And the first few weeks, we've been asking questions like, do science and religion disagree? Is there a God? And last week, we looked at the big question, why does God allow suffering? This week, we come to a really an important question. It's a pivotal question. And the question is simply this. The question is, who is Jesus? Is he just a good person or is he God? And really, I found that when we make up our minds about Jesus, it helps us to answer all the other questions. Because as we grow in our faith and maturity in our faith, I've learned that if I'm trusting in Jesus and, and I'm secure in that, if there are questions in the Bible that I have, and I have some questions about the Bible, how does this work, how does that work, but I'm able to take those questions and say, because I trust Jesus and because I've proven that that is true, I'm happy to put those questions on the shelf until I can answer them at a later stage. So this is a critical question to ask and answer. And history, I would like to show and say, history shows us that we can avoid the question for now, but we can't avoid the question forever. One of the eminent atheists of our day, Richard Dawkins, and I've mentioned his name a few times now, he's a professor at Oxford University, and so outspoken about atheism, well-spoken, intelligent, and he said this in his book about Jesus. He said, the balance of probability, according to most scholars, suggests that Jesus did exist. Did exist. In other words, he's saying that the evidence is there that Jesus was an historical person. And we know as we have looked through the centuries that Jesus has impacted so many millions of lives. Bono said the following. Bono said, it's a defining question. Who was Christ? I don't think you're led off easily by saying a great thinker, a great philosopher, because actually he went on to say he was the Messiah. So he has a tough question to ask ourselves, who is Jesus? And when we come to his teachings and, and the things that Jesus said, we have to make up our minds about him. And Jesus doesn't really leave us sitting on the fence. We either have to choose and, and say he is God, or as C.S. Lewis famously answered, that we have to then if, if we believe Jesus is not God, according to what Jesus said, that Jesus was either a liar, he didn't know what he was, you know, he was a liar, he didn't know what he was talking about, but he lied, or he was a lunatic, that he didn't actually know at all. We don't really have the choice that he actually was just a good person. Australians would say that Jesus is a good person. Roughly two-thirds of Australians would say that Jesus is somewhat or very important to them personally. Even though they may not call themselves Christians, they would say that Jesus has affected their lives. For example, the rule we know so well, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is something that we live by, and it's something we've learned from Jesus. So many Australians, in fact most, would say Jesus is somewhat or very important to them as a person. But the question we've got to ask is, is Jesus a good person? Is that all he was? Is he a God, one of the many millions of gods out there, as we had Viking gods and Celtic gods and Roman gods, is he just one of those, or is he truly the God, the only God? How do we answer this tough question? And I believe we have to go back to what Jesus said about himself. And of course, I'm going to use the Bible for this, and we haven't answered the question, can I even trust the Bible? And of course, we will come to that later as we can. But historians would say, and I'd just like to say this about the Bible, historians would say that we have far more evidence about the, the um, veracity or, or the, the authenticity around the ancient writings contained in our New Testament scriptures than we do about any other ancient person, like Caesar or anyone else. We have thousands, it's more than 13,000 manuscripts, and I think 22 or 23,000 manuscripts and references to Jesus and, and the Gospels and the New Testament written, and some very early manuscripts as well. So we won't go into that right now. But we want to step into a story that Jesus himself steps into, and it's the story called the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And I know this sounds like it might be long-winded, but let me explain it to you. There was a party going on. It was a party that was drawn out over a number of days, and, and Jesus was going to go to this. And this Feast of Tabernacles was a very important feast for the Jewish people. They were celebrating as one of the three most important feasts for them on their annual calendar. They were celebrating the time that they believed that God brought them out of slavery, out of Egypt, and did these amazing things and, and led them through the desert for 40 years. He led them by a pillar of, of light at night or a pillar of fire at night and, and a pillar of cloud during the day. He provided food for them miraculously. And so they celebrated this miraculous time of God's provision. And so Jesus is going to go to this feast. Initially, it doesn't look like he is, but he does go. And in this feast, during this time, he says a number of things about himself. And in this story, we'll also see people making up their minds about who he is. So let's journey with Jesus and people along with him as we do this. And first off, we're going to read about his brothers or his family. This is in John chapter 7 verses 2 and 3. So turn in your device or your Bible to that and follow along. This is what it says. When the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea. So Judea was where Jerusalem was, where the celebration was. So that your disciples may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. The reason I'm using a sarcastic voice, that's the best attempt at it, is because of this verse. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. You can understand why. Jesus, the oldest brother, yeah, he may have been good at things. Maybe he was on the first team for footy and just everything he did was just really awesome. But how, how do you make up your mind that he's actually God? No, he's just your brother. And they didn't believe that he was God, and he was saying things about himself and, and healing people, but they really didn't believe in him. Let's carry on. Among the crowds, this is verse 12, among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. He's a good man, good bloke. Others said, no, he deceives people. So he's deceptive. He's this liar, or he's demon-possessed, perhaps. Then the religious leaders get involved. So we read about them. They're called Pharisees. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about them, and so they decide to do something. Then the Pharisees, the chief priests and the Pharisees, sent temple guards to arrest Jesus. So Jesus hasn't even said anything, and they're about to arrest him to get him off the scene so it doesn't, it doesn't cause any trouble. But then the temple guards go there, and they hear Jesus talking, and they come back empty-handed. And, and we read about that in verse 45. A little bit of humor going on here. Verse 45, finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and to the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? They said this, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. In other words, that when they went to listen to Jesus, there was something about him that was different. I love what Andy Stanley said about Jesus, that people who were so unlike Jesus liked Jesus. These temple gods go there to listen, and they come away empty-handed, refusing to actually arrest him. So they're starting to make up their mind about who Jesus is in their minds. Jesus now begins to push people to a decision. And what Jesus is going to do through the story, and I believe even in our own lives, he wants to get us to a decision point. Sitting on a fence is not comfortable for anybody. And we need to make up our minds about who Jesus is. And so he begins to push people toward that. And he does it to us too. John chapter 8, verse 12. So we skip ahead a couple of verses. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. We'll come back to that little phrase, I am, in a moment. But it was so key to Jesus talking about himself. In fact, the writer of this book, the Apostle John, he uses the statement, I am, seven times because it's pointing to something important. And he uses seven miracles who talk about who Jesus is. And he uses seven witnesses. He calls seven witnesses, as it were, throughout his gospel to talk about who Jesus is. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What is he saying here? 
during this Feast of Tabernacles, they were celebrating that time when God led them out through this pillar of light or this pillar of fire. And they had these massive candlesticks standing in the, in the temple and they were lit up at night. And you can see in your mind's eye Jesus standing with these at his back and him talking about him being the light. These candlesticks were not just a symbolic representation of Christmas or something like that. They actually represented when the Jewish people thought about God and how God led them and protected them and was with them and led them through this desert for 40 years. Jesus was saying, you know what? I was actually that person. I'm not just coming to replace that that you know about. I actually am that person who led you. I'm God. I'm the person who looked after your ancestors. That's what he's saying here. He says, he is the light of the world. Not the new light, not the oldest past. He says, he is that light. So they ask him in verse 25, who are you? Who are you really? Story goes on a bit, and I'm skipped a couple of verses. You can read it for yourself. We go to verse 31 of John chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So here he's saying something else about himself. He's saying the very words he speaks are on par with the Old Testament scriptures. The Jewish word is the Torah. The Torah and the law. He said Jesus, so he's saying his words are on par with that. They are the word of God. They are God's word to you and to us. And he's saying if you keep these words, if you follow them, if you adhere to them, if you build your life around them, they will give you life. This is what they're celebrating at this Feast of Tabernacles. The life-giving time when God led them. God gave them the, the, the Torah when Moses went up the mountain the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament and the Bible. God gave them this life-giving word where God said, scriptures like man won't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. These were in those first five books in the Torah. Yet Jesus is saying, when you, if you follow my words, you will have life. So he's building his case around who he is. He speaks with authority. So the Jews answered him, Aren't we right, this is verse 48, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? You can see the, the, the energy levels are rising. Yes, so firstly, what's a Samaritan? A Samaritan was this distant cousin of these Jewish folk. Uh, their ancestors had intermingled with all sorts of nations. And Samaritans, the Jews said, Samaritans in their own mind had some idea about God, but they didn't have all of it. They were a little bit confused. They, they didn't quite have a grasp on all of it. They were a little bit ignorant. So Jesus, you don't really know what you're talking about. Aren't you some Samaritan coming to tell us here? We, we got all of this. We, we've worked it all out. You you're just got this half-truth, half-baked truth. Or either that, or either you're demon-possessed. Either you're out of your mind, and there's something else going on with you. <laughs> and Jesus doesn't just stop there and defend himself. He pushes even more. That's what I love about Jesus. Don't you love that? He, he, he pushes to the point where we actually need to learn, where we actually need to make a decision. He's not just content to be this grandfather in the sky, but he actually wants to get us to a point when we decide who is he really. So they go on to say this in verse 53. Are you greater than our father Abraham? So Abraham was their ancient ancestor, and they believe in, in the Jewish scriptures, and we believe that, that God appeared to, to Abraham in whatever way and, and spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm picking you. Abraham was, was, lived in a different country down in probably Saudi Arabia, somewhere there. And God called him away from that, called him to where he settled in Israel, nearby there. And God said to him, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And I'm going to bless you to such an extent when you look up at the stars and you, you can't even count the stars, your ancestors or your, sorry, your offspring are going to be like this. There are going to be so many of them. Not only am I going to bless you with that, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and give you wealth, but I'm going to bless those around you because of you, Abraham. And so these Jewish folk are holding on to that and saying, are you even greater than Abraham? You've spoken about Moses and the Word and, and the Torah and the desert, but hey, what about Abraham? What about him? Are you better than him? How do you top that one? Who do you think you are? 
they say. Mm, Jesus goes on. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. In other words, when Abraham looked ahead, he could see there was going to be a person like Jesus coming along who would fulfill all of those blessings and prophecies about Abraham. That all nations on earth will be blessed through somebody who is going to come. And so they go and they dumbstruck. They say, but you're not 50 years old. They say to him, and you've seen Abraham? Oh, Jesus, you must, you must be out of your tree. Jesus, you've lost it. Very truly, Jesus said in verse 58, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. A bit of a strange construction in English, but look at the reaction of the people around him. The next verse. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple guards and grounds. What was going on here? In the Jewish religion and in the Jewish mind, there was only one God. And we believe that as Christians, there's only one God. And somebody here had appeared on the scene, as C.S. Lewis says, somebody had appeared on the scene and had the audacity to say they were God. This God who's this infinite creator God who you can't even look at, he's here, he's talking to us, he's challenging us. That this is God? For them, that was blasphemy. Such words had never been spoken from human lips. It was, as C.S. Lewis says, it was the most shocking thing. Perhaps not never spoken. That's probably not true. Others had said they were messiahs. But this was the most shocking thing that had ever been uttered from human lips. These were not people who believed in multiple gods. And it was okay just to add another god into your the, the, the number of gods you had, that was okay. No, they believed only in one God. And Jesus here was claiming to be that God. How was he claiming that? The word when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, immediately in their minds, took them back to the story they knew so well when Moses met with, G with God in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, when, when God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt and Moses said to him, well, I can't just go back to people and say, well, God appeared to me in the desert and told me to come and lead you out. Who, who are you? What's your name? And, and God said, I am who I am. I am everything. And Jesus here uses the same language. He says, I am. And so they wanted to kill him. They needed to make up their minds about him. In fact, they killed him a little while later because of these very things, because they said he was blaspheming. Who is Jesus? History shows us we can avoid the question for now, but we cannot avoid it forever. For some of these Jewish folk, the leaders, they said, we can't avoid this question, we need to kill this man. For others, Jesus' brothers, we spoke about them. We read in, in history that they didn't believe in who Jesus was until he died and rose again. And his brothers became followers of Jesus. What would it take for somebody to say, my brother is actually the son of God, is actually God himself here on earth? It would take something like the death and resurrection. His brother James, we believe, became the first leader of the church in Jerusalem. His brother Jude wrote the book of Jude in the New Testament. His own brothers followed Jesus and gave their lives to him. His own brothers were put to death, or at least James, we know, was put to death because of his belief in Jesus. His own brother, James, had what, what his knees were so calloused from prayer that they said they called him Camel Knees. That was his nickname, Old Camel Knees, because he prayed so much to God. His life was transformed. He made up his mind about who Jesus was was. Bono, in an interview, and I read some of what he said early on, but he said this about Jesus, either he, in my view, was the son of God, or he was nuts. That's Bono for you, but he's right. Either he was the son of God, or he was nuts. 
So we have a whole lot of evidence from Jesus in front of us. And what we do with that is important now. There was this famous um, professor, in fact, what he said was quite famous and is used in the medical field. It was this professor who used to teach um, medicine at the Maryland School of Medicine in the U.S. And he said uh, many years ago, he said that students, when they come, they tend to look at things and tend to want to find the most random, um, obscure disease or diagnosis, the most exotic diagnosis. And he said, he said when you live in Maryland, when you hear, when you hear hooves beat, you need to think about seeing horses, not zebras. Maybe in Africa, when you hear who's beating, it would be zebras. But where we live in Australia, where they live in the U.S., when you, hear, when you see the obvious, when you hear the obvious, you think horses. You don't think they're zebras. And what they would say to us, when we see what's in front of us, we need to think about the obvious. Where does that obviously lead us to? And that's true if you don't believe in Jesus and don't follow him, and it's true for us who follow Jesus even now. And why do I say that? Because there's something about Jesus that brings this wonder into our lives. Australians would say that, that if, if you had to ask them, did Jesus make a big difference to the culture of our world? 85% of Australians would say that Jesus has changed our world, changed the culture in our world. And a student who had who encountered Jesus for the first time at uni, he wrote this about Jesus, and I want to read this. It's called The Wonder of Jesus. So listen to what the student said. You read about Jesus, but who is he? What is he? Listen to the description. Despite being absolutely approachable to the weakest, most broken people, he is completely fearless before the proud and the corrupt. Despite being profoundly human, And becoming weary and lonely and moved to joy and love and anger, we never see him moody. We never see him inconsistent. He's tender without being weak, strong without being harsh, humbled without the the slightest lack of confidence. He has conviction without intolerance, enthusiasm without fanaticism, holiness without legalism, passion without prejudice, This man alone never made a false step, never struck a jarring note. This is life at its best. And so Jesus steps into our space. He comes with all of the completeness of the perfect man because he is perfect, because he comes toward us to show us how we should live. So I find strength in this. I find strength in the the fact that, that I know that Jesus comes to me as a man and can help me as a man and a husband. And for the ladies at home, Jesus comes to you in ways and can help you as a mum and as a woman in this world. If you're a scholar or a student, Jesus brings to you and will challenge you and equip you and help you to be a great student. If you're an employer or employee, think what Jesus brings to that discussion around how we treat others that work for our organization and how we treat our, our, the companies we work for and, and the things that, that the company owns. Jesus steps into our space and, and looks after the, and will care for the drug addict. And he'll care, he won't send the prostitute away. He accepts the marginalized. And so Jesus brings this completeness to our story. So in fact, it's not just for people who are considering Jesus, but we have to make up our mind about who is Jesus really? Who is he really, even right now, in what I'm facing? The challenges I'm facing, how does who Jesus is come into my space and help me with that? Because let me be honest with you, as a a human being, and I'm sure you would agree with this, is that I have to work at this thing called following Jesus. I have to work at at my walk with Jesus because my own human heart would naturally want to move toward other ways where I can discount God or avoid calling Jesus God in my life. I naturally look for that. That's what my heart wants to do. I'm born with that bent, as it were. But Jesus comes in and he begins to reshape that. And I keep having to come back to who is Jesus really? Is he really God? Is he God in my life? Is he making a difference? Because friends, to be honest, if Jesus had to show up here and what we've read in the scriptures, we would fall to our feet. We would worship him. We would, we would surrender everything. We would surrender our agendas right now to him. And somehow we discount who he is and how he comes to us just because we do not see him. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, 
Old Testament scholars would tell us that, that God comes to people in three ways primarily. Firstly, that God's presence is seen in the, in the tabernacle or in the, before, even before the tabernacle, this pillar of cloud or this pillar of flame, that, that God's presence is seen in that. Secondly, that God's presence comes to us through his word. And thirdly, God's presence comes to us through his promised return one day. And think about how Jesus steps into our space. You see the presence of God. He's present with us. He is God in the flesh. We, we can go to him. Secondly, he speaks the word of God. And he speaks it to us. And thirdly, he's promised to return, that he will come back one day as the promised king to change things to how they should be. So my friends, as we encounter this question, who is Jesus? Is he a good man or good person or is he God? It's a question we all have to answer all the time. And I, what I love about Jesus, he steps into our space. He knows where you and I are at. He knows what we're facing. He doesn't condemn us. He simply points out where we're at and says, come on, I know you can do better and I'm going to help you. So I believe right now where you're sitting at home, Jesus will step into your space and say, you can do better. Let me help you. Or where you are doing well, you'll say, well done. That's great. Keep practicing that. Keep those routines up. Because Jesus has changed my life. He's changed millions of lives of people around the world. He split our Western time into, into two BC and AD. He's made such a difference to all of us. So I'm going to pray right now that, that Jesus Christ that we would experience Jesus Christ and his presence in such a special way on this day. And on Mother's Day, what a, what a great time to reflect on those beautiful attributes of a God who comes to us, who's loving and nurturing and kind and gentle and patient. Let's do that as we pray together, even now. Lord, we want to thank you that we can come to you, our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. And because the Holy Spirit is helping us pray, we thank you for this. We thank you that you're present with us. We thank you that you know where we're at. And Lord, so I bring our hearts to you, each of us, and I stand in the gap for everyone listening to this prayer, that you would step closer to us, that we would learn to see your presence. We would learn to see you. We would learn to trust your word. And we would learn to hope for your return and be ready for it and be prepared for it. And would you help us to live the life that you called us to? Would you help us answer the question, are you just a good man, a good person, or are you God, really, in my life today? Have I made you Lord and King today? Because, Lord, our hearts are prone to wonder. They're prone to wander away. Help us come back to you. And so we, we kneel before you, Lord, even with your brother James who had those camel knees. We think of that image, Lord. We kneel before you and we say, you are God and Lord. And would you come and be that? And for those, Lord, who for the first time are hearing this, I pray you would draw them closer to you, that they would discover that you are the light of the world, that you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And that if they would turn and trust in you, you would give them new life. And Lord, I pray you would come to them right now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'd love to journey with you, friends. So if you have some questions, please use in the description below. There's a, a link to contact us or go to our website and fill in that form, contact us. We'd love to help you if you want more information about how to follow Jesus. We have a little video that we've prepared and we can give you the link for that. So please make use of that. And please be assured that we are praying for all of you right now in this difficult time that you're being formed into more like Jesus. You may not think it, but we know that God is changing you right now. It's been so good to be with you on this special day. May God bless you. And may you know his blessing and peace in your life this week. Goodbye.